once again, it's <clears throat> just wanted to say thank you to the Taverner family for having me here. Pastor Taverner, thank you so much for having us come over here. It's always great to be here, and uh, the hospitality, like I said, is always top-notch. And I wanted to say thank you to the church family. Thank you for being here tonight. I know a lot of you probably worked a hard day today, and, and it's uh, not exactly easy to get around on an island. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Say, thank you so much for uh, just being here to support us and being here to support your pastor, being here uh, to uh, support the Lord Jesus Christ. We sang that song more and more about Jesus, and that's kind of what I want to preach about tonight. And uh, the title of my sermon is The Whole Gospel, The Whole Gospel, and I'm really going to give it to you tonight. So um, Pastor Tavener said that I is going to be more of a Bible study, and, and it is. But um, let's look down at our Bibles at Romans 5, verse 6. The Bible says, For when we were without, yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So I just want to point out there that Christ died and of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, and he did die. So did God die? Yes, he did. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he did die. Much more than being now justified by his blood. So uh, the Bible says we're justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So how are we saved? By wrath through him, but we are justified by his blood. So he died for us. He shed his blood for us, and we're saved by wrath through him. Justified means, uh, you could just say it like this, just as if I'd never sinned. Once that blood is applied to us, applied to the sinner, uh, through faith, we believe in him, and that blood is applied to us, then we are saved through wrath. It is just as if we'd never sinned. Verse 10, for if when we were, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So are we saved just through the blood, or are we saved just through his death? No, it says we're saved by his life also, right? Isn't that what it says? So, and it says, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, when it says the atonement, a lot of people will say, well, the atonement is just the blood. But is it just the blood? Is the atonement of Christ just the blood? Well, in these first, uh, verse 6 through verse 11, it seems to be saying a bunch of different stuff here, right? It's saying that Christ died. It's saying that we're saved through wrath through him. It's saying that we're justified through his blood. We're saved by his life. And then it says we've received the atonement. Now, I just want to present to you the fact that the gospel isn't just one thing. It's not just one aspect of, of things that Jesus did. It's, just not, it's not just the blood. It's not just the death. It's not just the fact that he raised from the dead, it's all these things in one package, the gospel or the good news. And of course, people don't have to understand every single little detail of this, this teaching that I'm going to teach tonight, but it is, you know, all this still is true and it is the gospel. But we don't have to obviously present every single aspect of what I'm going to preach tonight. But the blood atonement is just one aspect of the gospel. But the atonement that it's talking about is the whole thing, okay? It's not just one aspect of what it's being talked about here. If Jesus just bled but didn't die, would his sinless blood be enough to save all mankind? Would it be? No, it wouldn't. The full gospel also includes the perfect and sinless life of Christ. If he just shed his blood but was not sinless, but how he was a pretty good guy, would it have been enough? Absolutely not. If Jesus Christ was just a normal man, it would, you know, it just would, it would not be enough. You know, and, and so that's, you know, that's part of the gospel is that he had to have lived a perfect life. What about the prophecies? If one of the prophecies in the Old Testament did not come true about Christ, would, would he have been the Savior? 
No, he wouldn't have been the Savior. And, <clears throat> and Jesus had to die. What if he did all that other stuff, but then he bled for us, but then he didn't die? Would, it, would he have been the Savior? Could, could the blood have saved us? No, it couldn't have. So, and, and here's the thing. Jesus had to die, and the death of the testator had to happen for the New Testament to be in effect. That's what the Bible teaches. The, Levit the Levitical priesthood had to go away along with all those cardinal ordinances, along with the Sabbath day. Those things had to go away for Jesus Christ to be our Sabbath. You know, that's what the Sabbath pictured was that Christ had to do all that work for us and we have to rest from our own works and trust in Christ alone. That's what we go out and preach to people all the time. It's not of works, right? But it's the works that Jesus did, the finished works. So... And if he didn't die the death of a condemned, unsaved man, that wouldn't be taking our place, would it? So if Jesus just died, and then he didn't die the death of an unsaved person, would it have been enough? No, because didn't he take our place? Didn't he take the place of every man, woman, and child that's ever been born and ever will be born? Yes, he did. So, and then where did he take his place? You know, when he died, what does death actually mean? We, as Christians, if we're saved, when we die, we're not really dead. We're sleeping. That's what the Bible actually teaches. That's what Jesus said, Lazarus is asleep, and I'm going to wake him up, right? So Lazarus wasn't actually dead because dead people die and go to hell. Dead people die and go to hell, and people that are saved, they die, their body dies, but their spirit and their soul go to heaven. A saved person will never send, spend one second in hell. David never spent one second in hell. No Old Testament saint ever spent one second in hell. You and I will never spend one second in hell. And the reason why is because Jesus spent three days and three nights in hell for us, taking our place there because, look, if he didn't die the death of an unsaved person, then how could he have atoned for everything? So the whole package is the atonement. And so when people, you know, people like to just mock us and, and say that, you know, Jesus didn't go to hell for three days and three nights, which I just don't understand what the big deal is. Are we still saying he's there? Are we still saying he's in hell? It's like, it's blasphemy. No, it's not blasphemy. He, we think he's alive. We think he's in heaven. We just think that the Bible says what it says, and we believe what the Bible says. So they just want to just worm out and weasel out of what the Bible actually says and try to say, oh, it's Hades. Oh, it's, I mean, it's Gehenna and all this other stuff. It's like, yeah, you want to go back to the Greek. You want to go back to a foreign language to make it say something it doesn't say because you don't want to, what, admit that Jesus took your place for you? Like, I don't understand that. But if he didn't take the place of the unsaved, you know, because that's what we, he took the place of what we deserve to take. He took the, you know, he died for our sins on the cross. And then when he died, his body was buried in a tomb and his soul went to hell. Okay. That's what the Bible teaches. I'm going to get into the details of that, but he just, you know, it wasn't just the death of any run of the mill sinner. He died for every sinner and every sin that's ever been committed. So Ted Bundy, the little old lady that never trusted in Christ, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, Jeffrey Dahmer, the Pharaoh of Exodus, Judas Iscariot, every run-of-the-mill sinner that's ever been on the face of the earth that might not just be as bad as those people, Every homo, every pervert, every pedophile, every chomo, every sodomite, every drag queen, he died for them. Think about that. Because, I mean, do you believe he died for everybody? You have to believe that because that's what the Bible says, right? Turn to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. He Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. <clears throat> and I really do have to hurry in this sermon because there's a lot of stuff to go through. But, I mean, this is the truth. The truth is the gospel is not just one aspect. And people will try to say it's just this or it's just that. It's just the blood. It's not just the blood. But people will say it is. It's just the cross. No, it's not just the cross. 
It's, it, you know, the cross is very important, and preaching the cross is very important, but it's not just the cross. The gospel is not just the cross. Now, Hebrews 2.9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for how many people? Every man, right? And it's not just talking about man, men. He died for women, too, so don't get all upset. But he tasted death for every man. So that's everybody, right? For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So did he suffer on earth? Yes, he suffered on earth, but he also did suffer in hell. And that's the other thing that upsets people, that we say he suffered in hell. Okay, but I'll, I'll get to that later. But death is hell. If you die, that is going to hell. When, G, when the Bible says that he died, he went to hell. That's what it means. And I'll prove that beyond the shadow of a doubt. But that's, that's not all he did. When, then he rose from the dead. He rose from hell. So we don't believe he stayed there. But he rose from the dead. And after that, he had to place his blood upon the mercy seat. So, how was the Old Te Testament sacrifice done? Well, there had to be a perfect lamb or whatever animal it was. They had to be those clean beasts, right? But I'm just going to give a for instance here. The perfect lamb without blemish had to have no blemishes on it. Why? Because it's, how, it's picturing the Lord Jesus Christ, an innocent animal that's never done anything wrong. It has no outside, you know, no looks of blemish to picture something that's never sinned, right? It's killed. The blood is all drained from its body. It's put on the wood. That wood is caught on fire on an altar. It's salted with salt. It's cooked. It's burnt with fire. And then, depending on what type of offering it is, it's eaten. And then, that blood that was drained out of that animal is placed, you know, depending on what sacrifice or whatever it was, is placed on the mercy seat every year by the high priest alone. And that, you know, every, there's a lot of different offerings, okay? But I'm just saying, what, but what happened to that animal? Every sacrifice was burnt with fire, right? Okay, and every sacrifice was salted with salt. Every sacrifice was drained of all of its blood, Every sacrifice had to be perfect. There was a picture type of those atonement-style animals. And so people will say, well, the, the burning was just a picture of that animal going through the torment of the cross, okay? Well, I mean, so Jesus was put on a cross. That's pretty torturous itself, but what does that have to do with fire? At the end, you know, if you're put, he's put in the tomb... But the Bible does teach that his soul went to hell. And that's not the main focus of my sermon, but I am going to get into that pretty heavily. So, so the first thing I want to talk about here, um, I, I kind of just gave you a summary of everything, and now I'm going to try to get into the main uh, doctrines here. So the first thing is that to even be the one to pay the atonement for our sins, it had to be the right person. The only person that was able to do this was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He had to be perfect. He had to be sinless, a man and God at the same time. Turn to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. While you're turning there, I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Timothy 3, 16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Now, a lot of people say, you know, well, when did Jesus ever claim to be the Son of God? Well, let's look at John chapter 9, verse 35. It says, Jesus heard that they cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Is he calling himself the Son of God right there? I think he is. 
And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He claimed to be the Son of God. And this man here that he healed that was blind from birth, he believed on him. And Jesus said, I am, you know, he said, I'm the one, I am him. You know, he basically said he was. So in 1 John, let's see, John chapter 1. Turn to John chapter 1. You're already in John chapter 9. John chapter 1. Verse 41, he also had to be what the Bible talks about as the Messiah. It says, He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So every time you say they say Jesus Christ, it's talking about Jesus the Messiah. It's not his last name. Christ is on his last name, which is the title, what he the title given to him, he's Jesus the Messiah. So Christ means Messiah. The only person that could, could atone for our sins is Jesus the Messiah. And Jesus the Messiah is not just a man. He is the God-man Christ Jesus. And I won't have you turn here, but Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. I'm going to read Hebrews 4, 15 while you're turning there. Hebrews 4, 15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. So he had to be without sin. This is part of the gospel. Jesus had to be sinless. He could not have sinned ever. And that's what the Bible teaches. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who What's it say there? Who knew no sin. So he became sin. He wasn't a sinner, but he was made to be sin for us when he was put on the cross there, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So just a question. If Jesus didn't live a, sin, sinful, or excuse me, a sinless life, would his blood been acceptable? And I already asked that question, but what's the answer? It's no. It's, it, wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been acceptable. He had to live a sinless life. And it's so, again, it's not just the blood that atones for sin, is it? It's the precious, uh, you know, it's the life that he lived is part of it. So, but he did have to become sin for us who knew no sin because that's really the only thing that would cancel, that, that's the only thing that cancels it out, right? Because Adam sinned. So someone that had known no sin had to be killed in his place to redeem us. Number two, his blood had to be shed. That's also a fact. So he had to be sinless. He had to be God. He had to be the Messiah. He had to be a man. But he also had to shed his blood for us. Now turn to Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 11. And the Bible does teach that without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. So there's no taking it away, is basically. There's no way to take away sins without blood being shed for it. So you've heard of like cancer remission where, it, where cancer will go away or, or be in remission. So when it's talking about no shedding, of, no, without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin, there's no taking it away without that shed blood. Leviticus 17, 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for for the soul. So, but if you just took that work, that that passage right there and just said, okay, well, that's all it is. It's just the blood. But is that true? It's not true that it's only the blood. So now 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin, sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. When it's talking about stripes, it's talking about bloody stripes that are left by a whip, right? And it's referring back to Isaiah 53. But it says that he bear our sins in his own body on the tree, 
but we are healed by, by those stripes. That is part of the atonement. First, you're already in First Peter chapter two. Look at verse or chapter one, First Peter chapter one verse eighteen. It says, <clears throat> "For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tra- by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ." As a lamb without blemish and without spot, so it's ref- you know so it's referring back to the fact that he had to have a sinless life as a lamb without blemish or spot, but with the precious blood of Christ. There's no blood that cleans like His blood. There's no blo- the, the the blood of go- uh, bulls and goats and animals. That was just a temporary thing. It was a picture. And it could never take away sins. The book of Hebrews makes that very clear. Turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. Actually, turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. So Jesus Christ has redeemed us to God by his blood. 1 John 2.2 2 says, and he, who's it talking about? Who's the he? It's Jesus Christ, is the propitiation for our sins And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So that word propitiation there is kind of a a big word that's used in the Bible. A lot of times, God, you know, most of the time God just uses really simple words and simple phrasing. But this word is one that's kind of a little, it's a word that we don't use very often. But it means, it it literally, it means the atonement. It means the appeasing of God, the satisfaction of his wrath. So, Basically, when Christ died for us, he shed his blood for us, that blood satisfies the wrath of God against us. So it, 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 it's not just the propitiation for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So everybody can be saved, but they just don't choose to be saved. So he did die for the sins of the whole world. But the whole world doesn't get saved. And, and so they have the opportunity. He gave everybody the opportunity, but not everybody chooses to take that opportunity. So I'm going to kind of rifle through some of this other stuff here. Number three, it had, he had to die in the right place. Where did Jesus, what place did Jesus die in? He died in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. I mean, his base is so, and I'll come, I'll come back to that later, but specifically, Number four, in the right location. You know, he was at that place, but he was outside the camp, right? The Bible talks about him going outside the camp, so he was outside the city gates at Mount Calvary. Number five, at the right time and day he had to die. He died when? What day was it? Anybody know? The Passover, right? He died at the Passover. At even, he died at the, at the time of the Passover. So he fulfilled that timing that was in Exodus chapter 12 where they were supposed to keep the Passover, you know, strike the, the doorpost with, his, with the blood, and, you know, God would pass over them and not kill the firstborn of all those people who were born of the children of Israel. And so if they put that blood and struck it above the door, struck it on the doorpost, that's that picture of Christ, and Christ was the Passover lamb. When John the Baptist saw him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So, um, so when he died, he had to die that specific day, that specific time. Now, a lot of people will say, like John MacArthur, you know, the devil that's going to go to hell here pretty soon, hopefully. He said, uh, the blood, you know, Jesus' blood, when he died, it just went down into the ground. It's, it's not, there's nothing magical about, about his blood. And... I don't like to use that word magical because Jesus isn't like some magician or sorcerer or something. So, but there is something special about his blood. So to, to just say that his blood just trickled into the ground and it was gone and there's nothing 
special about it. That's not true. That's not true. And, and you know, just because someone, you know, he pay, you know, when he died, he did pay for the sins of the world with that blood, but that, but that has to go to the right place. When you pay for something, don't you have to pay the right people and, and go to the right place to pay for it? Like, when you have a bill due at your house, like, you know, say you're, you guys have electric bills here that's combined into other stuff, right? I don't know how, how that works. It's electric, and what else is it? Gas? Gas. It's probably like, whew, it's super expensive, right? So do they just accept if you just like write a check for it and just leave it on your coffee table? They don't, do they? So, I mean, you, but you wrote the check, right? You wrote the check and you just left it on the table. Is that good enough? No, you have to take it to the right place, don't you? So, and I'll get into that more later, but you don't, you have to put, you have to take the payment to the correct location. So I'll get back to that later. But number six, it had to be, he had to die in the right manner. Look at Galatians chapter three, verse 13. While you're turning there, I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 again. I already went to that verse, but I'm going to read it again. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when he died on the cross, he became sin for us. Just like, you know, in Mo when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, they had to look at that, and that, that snake on that brazen snake, serpent on the pole became a curse. You know, they were cursed by the snakes biting them, but if they looked at that, and they lived, right? So when they look, Christ became a curse, and when, they, when we believe on him, then we live also. So, but Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So when he was crucified, in the Old Testament, there's a law that says if you're hung upon a tree, you have to be taken down at even. Uh, that was a law in Israel. And, and in the book of Judges, you'll see, or uh, in the book of Joshua, they would, take, they would conquer those kings in the promised land, and they would hang them on trees. But they always took them down like they were supposed to, according to the law of Moses. And, and the same thing happened with Christ. He was hung on a, on a tree and killed. And he became a curse. You know, the, God probably just wrote that in there, you know, because when Christ was crucified, he became a curse for us. And because it's written, curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So he had to die in the right way. And when he died there, he became that curse for us. So number seven, the prophecies had to come true. So not a bone could be broken. They cast lots for his raiment. They, he was buried in a rich man's tomb. He was given gall to drink on the cross or vinegar. They spit in his face. They smashed him in the. They hit him in the face with their palms. They punched him in the face. They, um, you know, the prophecy of the, they shall look on him who they pierced. They, he gave his back to the smiters. They uh, they pierced his hands and his feet according to the book of Psalms. Um, you know. The, his soul would not be left in hell, according to Psalm chapter 16. In Leviticus chapter 23, you know, all those, those feasts represent something, and they, they lead to us, you know, they lead you to Christ. Um, they, they're full, they need to be fulfilled by Christ. So in Leviticus 23, after the Sabbath, the wave offering had to be done by the high priest. And I'll get into that later, but... Also, the mercy seat. You know, why did, why did the tabernacle have to be set up exactly the way it had to? Because it was patterned after what was already in heaven. So, and what, but why? Because that stuff had to, has something to do with the atonement later on. Now, so, and now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I know I'm going through stuff really fast and we're turning to a lot of stuff, but all this stuff is important. Now, um, the nutshell of the gospel, though, is what? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, right? If you just had to sum it up really quickly, you would say it's the death, burial, and resurrection, wouldn't you? Now look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Paul sums it up for us right here. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So there you have the death, and it's according to the Scriptures, right? 
and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So you have the death, you have the burial, and you have the resurrection. And it says, and he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. So people saw him, people witnessed this. The apostles saw him risen from the dead. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. So Paul is the last apostle. So all these charlatans out there that are saying they're apostle so-and-so, they're stinking liars. There's no apostles after the apostle Paul. He's the last apostle. It says it right there. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. So now, again, so I just want to caveat this also as it being a nutshell. It's not the all-inclusive gospel. It doesn't have everything I've been talking about. It's not going to have everything I'm going to continue to talk about. And, you know, I got saved without being explained everything I'm about to talk about. Uh, did everything that I'm talking about get explained to you when you got saved? Probably not. But it doesn't mean that it's all not important things to know. So you want to learn more and more about Jesus, you sang about it tonight, so we're learning more and more about Jesus. But, um, you know, these things are important to know, you know, to know everything concerning Christ. You know, he, he expounded things on the road to Emmaus to them that they had no idea about. You know, he talked about how he was written into the Psalms and all these different things on the road to Emmaus. He opened up the eyes of their understanding. So <clears throat> I, got, I got saved without someone explaining to me that Jesus died and went to hell. Who, who else did? Raise your hand. A lot of people. So what, what, am I, what I'm about to say is that you don't have to explain that to people for them to get saved. So, and I'm not saying don't explain it to them. But I think that sometimes, you know, people tend to overemphasize this, especially in churches like ours, you know, but don't, don't, our need, our knee-jerk reaction sometimes is to hit people with stuff that, because nobody's explaining things right, and then we'll over-explain things, and when we're trying to get people saved, we don't have to just bash them over the head with Jesus went to hell for three days and three nights, Okay. So I'm not saying don't, don't say it, but I've gotten plenty of people saved without explaining that. So I'm not saying don't put it in your gospel presentation, do, but that shouldn't overtake Jesus' ministry, dying on the cross, raising from the dead. I think that, you know, raising, he, that's part of him raising from the dead. Peter preached about that in Acts chapter 2. He mentions it twice in his, in his, uh, his, his sermon in, on the day of Pentecost. He mentions it twice. But I'm just saying that Paul doesn't mention it here, does he? But death is hell, isn't it? So I'm not saying don't mention it. I'm not saying, you know, you shouldn't have it in your presentation. But I'm just saying, you know, if, if the pendulum's over here, we shouldn't swing it all the way over to here. Does that make sense? And, you know, so I'm just saying I've seen people overdo that part, and we're trying to get people saved. We don't have to, like, if someone doesn't already believe, if someone doesn't believe that or, like, you know, they're fighting with you about that, that's not a point of contention that we need to, to fight about. So um, anyway, hopefully that, that helps you out. But uh, uh, we just need to be balanced. That's all. You know, when we're trying to get people saved, let's get people saved, not try to teach them our new IFP doctrine. Anyway, it's not new IFP doctrine. It's Bible doctrine. But you know, you know what I'm saying. Number eight, he had to die the death of an unsaved man. I already kind of covered that. But this includes hell. And... Uh, uh, again, a saved man never spends one second in hell. Number nine, I want to, uh, you know, this isn't necessarily part of the gospel, but I do want to explain this. So, well, I mean, it, it kind of is. I mean, the Trinity is important for people to understand. And when you're given the gospel, I think it's important to bring up, you know, because people will say, well, if you ask people if they believe that Jesus is God, sometimes they'll say, no, I believe he's the son of God, which he is. But that's an opportunity to, you know, if someone doesn't believe that Jesus is God, then they're not believing the truth. So you do have to explain that to people. You do have to take some time and help them understand that. But I want to talk about the Trinity of Jesus being in multiple locations at the same time. Trinity. When he died, he was in multiple locations at the same time. You know, because he is God, right? And God is a Trinity. 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But when Jesus died, he was in different locations also. Guess what? When you die, you're going to be in different locations. Your body's going to be wherever it's at, and then your soul and spirit are going to be in different locations. But your soul and spirit, if you're saved, are going to be in heaven, right? But um, so let's turn to Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. So I was talking to this Jehovah's Witness, and I was thinking, why am I fighting with this Jehovah's Witness? Like, it was the last door. I know, we're not supposed to just fight with heretics or whatever. But it did kind of help me prepare for this a little bit, because he, you know, he helped me to kind of brush up on something that I'm about to teach to you right now. Um, so first I want to show you that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost raised all raised Jesus from the dead, okay? And then I'm going to show you that he was in different locations at the same time. But God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, the Spirit raised him from the dead, and Jesus raised himself from the dead. But this Jehovah's Witness is like, oh, well, if Jesus died then that, and he was God, that means God died. I was like, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, isn't that what I said? And then he's like, well, I was like, yeah, he's, you know, his soul was in hell, you know, his, his spirit was in heaven and his body was in the tomb. But, you know, he was just acting like that's not, and then when I, we, I didn't, my phone doesn't have service unless I have like a, a hot spot right now. So I couldn't really look up the verses when I was there. And really, you know, Clifford just saved me from just battling with this guy. But Brother, Brother Clifford looked up a verse and he just didn't want to accept it. But it, it did help me to spark this interest. So look at, you're in Galatians 1.1. Look at this. So the father raised Jesus from the dead. Look what it says. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ the, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So who raised Jesus Christ from the dead? What's it say right there? The Father, God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So did God the Father raise Jesus from the dead? Now, the Bible also says the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Look at Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. Romans 8, 11 says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, oh, the spirit, dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. What spirit dwells in you when you get saved? The Holy Spirit, right? You're like, well, I don't know. That doesn't sound too convincing. Well, okay, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, 18. 1 Peter chapter 3.18. 1 Peter chapter 3.18. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto them, oh, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but what's it say there? quickened by, what's it say there? The Spirit. Is that in capital letters? That's because it's talking about the Holy Spirit. So that word quickened means made alive. So who brought Jesus back from the dead? Well, God, it says God the Father did, right? In Galatians chapter 1. And then here in two different verses I showed you the Spirit brought Jesus back to life. And then now turn to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Verse 19, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So do you think he did? Well, as he said he will. Do you think he was lying? He can't lie. <laughs> so he said, I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in, in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So when he died, he's talking about his body. He was going to raise his own body from the dead. John chapter 10. You're already in the book of John. Look at John chapter 10, verse 17. John chapter 10, verse 17. John chapter 10, verse 17. The Bible says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. 
No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So Jesus Christ raised himself up. The Holy Spirit raised him up. God the Father raised him up. So there you have the Trinity raising Jesus from the dead. And Jesus Christ having the, his own power to raise himself from the dead. And so for those people that like to explain away Jesus' soul going to hell, and then, it's, you, know, you know, when the, the thief on the cross says, today thou, will be, thou shalt be with me in paradise, well, I mean, Jesus' spirit went back to God in heaven. Jesus' soul was in hell, and his body was in the tomb. That's pretty simple. Uh, I'll cover that a little bit more as we get along here, but um, let, let's move on. Jesus had to go to hell. Jesus had to go to hell. So, and, and look, Jesus wasn't an avatar, okay? He wasn't just some avatar that God sent down as a mockery of, of you know, this isn't, this isn't some James Cameron movie or something. Jesus was really the son of God. He was really a man. He, you know, felt all the pain. He went through all the, the things that, and, and felt every single thing. He felt our pain. He felt our frailness. He, he understands us because he was one of us. He feels the infirmities that we feel because he understands us. He understands our frame. He understands that we're weak. But uh, Jesus going to hell is not a literal hell according to Manly Perry. You know, Manly Perry? Manly, not so Manly Perry? <clears throat> he said a long time, he said when, you know, a long time ago, it was a long time ago, he said, nobody burns in hell. We like to say he's, ro you know, people are roasting like a hot dog, but that makes for good preaching, but it's just not really true. And of course, he backed off of saying that. You know, once he got the, the full, f you know, flame wars of the new IFB, when we came down on him like a ton of bricks, of course, he changed what he was saying about that. So, but he calls what we what we believe the hell atonement, even though we never call it that. We don't call it the hell atonement. I've never called Jesus going to hell the hell atonement. But uh, recently, him and his buddy, Adam Fannin, SOB, Sheba, the son of Bikri, uh, from LOL Baptist Church, and Michael Johnson from Temple of the Dog Baptist Church, they did this like rail fest and you know called us all unsaved for preaching this truth, this Bible truth. It was really hard to sit through it. It actually just made me really angry and then I got COVID because of it. I think they actually gave me COVID because I listened to that stupid crap. But um, even, you know, again, even though we don't believe that Jesus is still in hell, you know, even though I don't believe that someone has to know that in order to get saved. I just said that. I don't think any pastor that I know believes that. We believe what King David believed. We believe what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and what Jesus said about the only sign he would show people that are asking him for a sign. What do he say? The sign of Jonas the prophet that he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And in the heart of the earth is where hell is, okay? That's not paradise, okay? That's where hell is. So, of course, again, I believe that his spirit was in paradise, but not his soul. So, um, we, look, we believe in the risen Savior. How's that heretical? I don't understand. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now, you know, we believe the Bible, and so you can try to explain these verses away all you want, but it's just facts. It's just Bible. It's just what it says. And to just try to explain this stuff away. This is the other thing that the Jehovah's Witness said, is that when I said about Jesus going to hell, he's like, you know what hell means, right? Sheol. Gehenna. Hades. Bozo. So it's like basically, you know, these guys are, are, are in agreement with the Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, they just believe that it just means the grave or whatever. But that's not what it means. 
because hell always means hell, a place of burning fire and torment where people go for all eternity, okay? So Acts chapter 2, verse 22 says, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up. There's another one where God raised them up. Having loosed the pains of death. So it says loose the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now, if his body was just there and he wasn't experiencing any pain, look, if, you're in a, if your body is just dead on the ground, you're not experiencing any more pain in that body. So how is he experiencing pain exactly then? Just explain that to me real quick. How are you experiencing pain? If he's in paradise and not experiencing, you know, are you experiencing pain in paradise? Oh, it's Abraham's bosom. So it's just a case of heartburn? <laughs> Abraham had some heartburn that day? It's hotel hell? That's where he went? Because this says that he was loose from the pains of death. <coughs> and if you have the interpretation that death is hell then you got the right interpretation. So was Jesus just in the grave feeling no pain? Well, yes. The body was. His body was feeling no pain. Buried in the tomb. His human body was, you know, the body that was there is not feeling any pain. So what part was feeling pain? His soul was in pain. The pains of death, that sounds like you're hurting, right? <clears throat> Look at verse 27. Because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So, see how it's making a difference between the corruption? The corruption's talking about the body. But the soul is, you know, inside of us. We can't see the soul. But there is a soul in each one of us, and if that soul leaves the body, you're dead. And that soul goes somewhere. It either goes to heaven or it goes to hell. And according to this verse, it says God wouldn't leave his soul in hell. So that means by deduction, Watson, where does it have to be? Sherlock Holmes, where does it have to be? It has to be in hell, doesn't it? You stinking idiots that say that, you know, Adam fanning these bozos. Well, it's, hell's just the cross, brother. No, that's not what it says. Does that say cross? You won't leave my soul on the cross? Is that what it's saying? No, he's already dead. His, his soul, his body was taken off the cross already, wasn't it? Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 21 says this. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast goeth downward to the earth? So in Ecclesiastes, the Bible teaches that the spirit of man goes upward when it dies. Where does it go? Well, it goes to, to be upward, right, and with God. <coughs> Excuse me. Same chapter in Ecclesiastes 12, 7. I'm not going to have you turn there. You can just write it down. Or if you want to turn there, you can, but it's going to be real quick. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto the God who gave it. Where does your spirit go once you die? Unto the God who gave it. So when Jesus died, where did his spirit go? Unto the God who gave it. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So when he created man, every person has a living soul. But <coughs> excuse me, Adam and Eve screwed all that up for us. So now the spirit does go to be God, with God who gave that spirit, but the soul either goes to heaven or hell, right? So Jesus Christ himself was in that Trinity situation where his body's in a grave, his soul is in hell, and his spirit's in heaven. Does, I mean, am I, am I wrong about that? I mean, I just, okay. <coughs> it's not real hard to figure out, is it? So Hebrews 12, 9 says, Furthermore, we have 
had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Who's the Father of spirits? It's God. Who gives the, who gives the spirits out? God does. And where do they return to? They return to the God that gave it. So, you know, and look, not every... People, this is one of their arguments. Well, the Bible never says that Jesus burned in hell. But <laughs> what do we know about hell? Has there ever been a, a, a mention of hell where it's a, in a good context? It's like Miami Beach. You just get a suntan there or something? I mean, there's never a verse that hell is talked about in a positive mention at all. It's always burning, screaming, gnashing of teeth, outer darkness, you know, lasting forever, worm dying not, fire not being quenched. So, I mean, if your soul goes to hell, it's going to be going through some agony. So, I mean, I remember a long, when I first got saved and I was going to a Baptist church and I, I read this, 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 these verses in Acts and I was like, wow, it says that Jesus' soul was in hell. And I went to my pastor and I asked him about it. And he's like, yeah, that just, uh, if you go back to the Greek, it says, you know, da, 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 da. I was just like, oh, okay, pastor. But like, I remember thinking like that was a, not a very good answer. But I just kind of tucked it away and just forgot about it. But it's not like I never asked that question before. But I just kind of trusted my pastor was going to tell me and, and steer me in the right direction. A, we, we got a lot of Baptists, we got a lot of people that just say that that's not true, but what does the Bible say? I don't care what Baptists in the past say, I don't care what Christians say, I don't care what theologians say, what does the Bible say? Amen. What saith the scriptures? That's what the most important thing is to know. Jesus' body was buried, his spirit went to the, to the Father, his soul went to hell. That's what the Bible says, it's not, you know, it's not a real brain buster. Look at verse 31, back in, I probably, I didn't have you turn, you're still in Acts, right? Acts chapter 2, verse 31. So this is the second time it's being mentioned here. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, talking about David, that his soul was not left in hell. So what's it talking about? The resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. So again, it's separating both of them, isn't it? It's separating the soul from the body, when it's talking about his flesh not seeing corruption and his soul not being left in hell. So, <clears throat> again, if his soul wasn't left there, by deduction, you have to know that it was there. And how long was it there for? Three days, three nights. He rose from the dead. So, it says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Of course, it's a very famous passage about the suffering of the Savior. This is what the Ethiopian eunuch was reading as he's riding in the chariot. But um, all offerings were what? burnt offerings. Nothing was sacrificed without fire. Just remember that. Isaiah 53.10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. His soul an offering for sin. I'm not saying his soul didn't agonize in the torture that he, he received and the torture he received on the cross. I'm not saying that. But the whole thing, there's fire at the end of every offering in the Old Testament. Sorry, but that's just the truth of it. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, his soul was not left in hell. So it says, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. So um, now turn to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. So I just wanted to show a couple spots in the Old Testament that's kind of, you know, giving us this picture also. <clears throat> in 
Genesis chapter 22 is one of my favorite because, look, everybody knows that the sacrifice of Isaac, where Abraham's about to plunge the knife into his own son, is a picture of what? The sacrifice of Jesus, right? Everybody knows that. And look at verse 6 in Genesis 22, verse 6. It says, <clears throat> And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And, you know, it's him. But anyway, and Abraham said, My son, this is really important here. God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. God was the lamb. He's provided for himself, Jesus Christ, the lamb for the burnt offering. So now, of course, we know that the lamb, you know, that ram gets caught in the thickets and that fulfills immediately that, that, that picture. You know, he, God doesn't let him kill his son, of course, and then... You know, everything is right and well. But this is a prophetic statement here. God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And what happens to burnt offerings? Well, at the end, they get burnt, don't they? So this foreshadowing of Jesus, we have the immediate fulfillment and the one in the future at Calvary. Now, I want you to turn to Psalm chapter 88, and I'm about to show you something here that is super interesting. Um, Psalm chapter 88, verse 4. Remember I was going about all, on about all those different types of people that Jesus died for, including the pedophiles and all these different people, right? So, in Psalm chapter 88, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, and I, I, so when, when the Psalms are being, you know, when Jesus said that all those things in the Psalms and, and, and all the different things in the Old Testament had to be, these are the things that are fulfilled, the Psalms, there's a lot of Psalms that are fulfilled in Jesus. I believe that this is a Psalm that's fulfilled in, in Christ here. And just, just listen to what it's saying and, and while you read along. It says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. Did Jesus deserve to go down into the pit? The pit is hell, okay, just so you know. I am as a man that hath no strength. So is Jesus just a man? No, he's not. He's also God. But he's as a man that has no strength. He's, in, he's counted as them that go down to the pit, but he doesn't deserve to be counted with them, does he? It says, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more. And let me just tell you something. If you die and go to hell, your name is remembered no more. God doesn't care about you anymore. And people are just like, how could a, a, a loving God just send somebody to hell? Well, because they chosen not to, not to believe in him and, and love him and have faith in him, then he chooses to remember them no more either. It says, and they are cut off from my hand. Thou hast laid me, and what's it say there? The, the highest part of hell where it's nice and just a toasting? It's just a tan? No, it says, thou hast laid me in the lowest pit. What would that mean? That Jesus, if this is talking about Jesus, which I think it is, that's my opinion, that he's in the lowest part of hell, right? In darkness, in the deeps, thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with some of thy waves, a lot of them. No, what's it say? All thy waves. Every, you know, when it's talking about waves, it's talking about the wrath of God, the waves of wrath. And it says, Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up, and I cannot come forth. You know, and, and again, Jesus, of course, came forth after three days and three nights, but in the meantime, all the wrath of God has come upon him. The lowest part of the pit is where he's at. I mean, that's a tough... So, like... I mean, I think most of us believe in here that, that understand this doctrine. We, we know that Jesus, it was as if he was in hell for all eternity. Who, I mean, most people believe that, right? 
So then it makes sense that if he's dying for the sins of every single person that ever lived and ever will live in every single sin that they ever committed and the worst possible people that you could think about, that that would make sense that he would be in the lowest pit. Because if he had to die for the worst person, then he had to, to take the place of that person's, you know, because, you know, when, when he talks to Pilate, he says, the people that delivered me unto you have the greater sin, have the greater, you know, they have the greater damnation. He talked about people having a greater damnation. There are greater damnations. There are greater sins. And some people, you know, the little old lady that just didn't get saved, but she was a pretty good person in our, in our view, is not going to be in the same place as Joseph Stalin. Okay, Joseph Stone's going to be in a worse hell than most people are for killing millions and millions of people, right? Or the worst false prophet that sent the most people to hell is going to be in one of the worst places in hell compared to the person that just didn't get saved, right? Does that make sense? <clears throat> anyway, it says, Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hand Unto thee. Skip down to verse 14. It says, Lord, why casteth thou off my soul? My soul. So it's not the body, not the spirit, but what? The soul. Why hidest thou thy face from me? The first time that the son was ever separated from the father for any reason was the day that he died on Calvary and the time that he spent in hell for three nights and three days. Jesus had never been separated from the Father before. So when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me when he was on the cross? Because God, he, because Jesus became sin for us. Because Jesus became an abomination, a detestable thing, because everything that, that had ever been done in this world, never will be, was put upon him, and God could not look at him. God did not want to look at him. And he was satisfied with the punishment that he gave Christ. So when we think about how much of a sacrifice Jesus really gave for us, he gave a lot. He was punished a lot. All his waves were laid upon him. He was in the lowest pit, according to this psalm. And it says, Why hidest thou thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about altogether. And, you know, when he talk, it talks, it's talking about the waters and stuff like that, then think back to Jonah. Think back to the, the parallels with Jonah, him being swallowed by the whale. He's inside the whale. He's going down. The waves are billowing over him. When he gets thrown into the, into the sea, the waves are crashing. Those waves are just pictures of hell and torment and persecution and, you know, being, going through the wrath of God. So, I mean, here, so if you believe that Jesus went to hell, you know, what do you believe, what punishment do you believe that he got? Was he getting a light toasting? Was he getting a tan? Was he in Abraham's, you know, heartburn? Was he no heat at all? Or was it the worst it could possibly be because he's taken the place of every sinner that was ever born and every sin? I mean, that's what I believe because, I mean, I, I think that this psalm is kind of laying it out for us. But, uh, you know, according to a bunch of unsaved idiots like Manly Perry, Adam Fannin, and Michael Johnson, you know, we're unsaved because we believe this. We're unsaved because we believe that the Bible is true. And they want to just explain all this away, and you're just like, you know, those guys are old news. Why are you bringing them up? Well, because they're bringing up lies. They're bringing up heresy. Like, they were all aboard on this until they left. It's like, you know, the reason why they, they, you know, the first thing they want to change on is this doctrine because their old IFB buddies won't take them back probably until, you know, they, they change on this doctrine. So then they have to like, well, I just never really felt like it was right when I was preaching it, you know. And, well, why'd you preach it then, you, you, you idiot? If it was so bad, why you preach it? Why'd you preach it then? Because... You just are trying to fit in, you know. You probably just, you don't believe anything. You probably, you're just riding on people's coattails, trying to be cool. And you're not still cool. You never were. Anyway, so number 11, he had to resurrect from the dead. 
And here's another thing that Michael, not so manly Perry, says. The resurrection is not part of the atonement, okay? But turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I know we're, we're getting a little long here, but I'm going to try to hurry through the rest of this here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. It says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, give you time to turn there, 1 Corinthians 15, 12. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then, there, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false prophets of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised up not up, if, if so be that the dead rise not. He's basically saying, if what we're saying is not true, then, you know, Christ isn't really raised from the dead. And we're false prophets. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and you are yet in your sins. So is it part of the gospel? Is it part of the atonement or not? Because if you're still in your sins, and you just think, you think all the other stuff's true, but Christ is, didn't really rise from the dead? What's it say? You're yet in your sins. You're not saved. If you don't believe the resurrection, you're not saved. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. They're gone. They're not coming back. So it is part of the gospel. It is part of the whole atonement, isn't it? Number 12, he had to become the high priest. Now, this might be a little bit controversial. Turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 7. I've said a couple controversial things, but I'm not trying to be controversial just to be controversial. I just, I, this is what I believe. So, now, a lot of people think, there's people that believe differently about this, and I talked to Pastor Taverner before I preached this, okay? So, I don't personally believe that Jesus was Melchizedek. Now, if, he turns, if it turns out that he was, then I'm okay with that. I'm not, like, I'm not like super dogmatic about it, but I just don't, like after reading through it and stuff, I just, I don't think that he was, okay? But I think that he's a priest, for a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, after the similitude of Melchizedek. So, and, and here's the thing. I don't care... You know, you can believe whatever you want. I'm not like being like, I'm not saying you're, you know, whatever, you're wrong and I hate you or whatever if you don't believe what I believe. Okay, it doesn't matter. But what, it, what does matter is that Jesus Christ became the, our high priest. When he died and he rose again, his endless life made him become the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's what I believe, okay? Who, what was the priesthood before Jesus died and rose again. When he died, what happened to the, to, the, to, the te, to the veil in the temple? It rent in twain, right? And that symbolizes what? That, you know, God doesn't use that place anymore, really. And that he has separated the Gentile, you know, to where the Gentiles and the Jews can, can get along and be one in Christ Jesus and, you know, that there's the, the Old Testament's gone. That temple is no longer needed to be used, basically. And then when he rose from the dead, he rose as with an endless life because he died and he rose again. He's got the scars to prove it, right? So look at uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 15. So it says, And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. So that's a, an, another reason why I think that, okay? It's after the similitude. It's like it, right? Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling from the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Skip to verse 27. It says, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's? 
but for this he did once when he offered up himself. So he offered up himself for the law make it, maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. So, I mean, it's just to me, it sounds like it's saying that, that he, once he offered up himself, he, is, he offered himself because he is the high priest now. And so it says, since the law maketh the son. So when, when did he become the high priest? Since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. So, and then number 13, um, once he rose from the dead, he had to appear before God after the Sabbath day, right? You know, when he rose from the dead, what day was it? It was Sunday, wasn't it? So turn to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. So I'm trying to kind of just get through it now. Again, people don't have to know this stuff to get saved. But I believe that Jesus had to appear before God after he resurrected. Okay, so Jesus resurrected from hell. He's the, now the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You know, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. We take our prayers to him. For, you know, we can go to God the Father through Christ Jesus, and he will give us what, whatever we ask for as long as, of course, it's in his will. He's not going to give us the Maserati that you're asking for necessarily because he knows you'll wrap it around a telephone pole or something. But he knows how Pastor Taverner drives. Who, who else was driving crazy here today? Who, who was it? Was it you? <laughs> he was, you said you were a road raging. You can't have too fast of a car, brother. Anyway, so I'm pointing them out. I'm sorry. Uh, so Leviticus 23, verse 10. So this is, you know, this is talking about the feast of the Lord. So it says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and ye shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow, after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So this is specifically right after the or right after, if you read up or if you want to read later, it's right after the Passover, okay? And so after the Passover, then it says that on the morrow after the Sabbath. When was that? The day that Jesus rose from the dead, when you're talking about going in order of, you know, and then, of course, you have all those things kind of falling in order, like Pentecost is 50 days after uh, you know, the resurrection or whatever. But anyway, it says, and you shall offer that day a wave, the sheaf of the lamb, uh, of an he lamb without blemish of the, of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. So, but I wanted to show you that, that the first fruits had to be presented to the Lord that next day, right? And what do we know about Jesus? That he is Christ, the first fruits. He's the first begotten of the dead. He's the firstborn of the dead. He's the only one that has a resurrected body, even right now. Nobody else has a resurrected body except for Jesus Christ. He is the first fruits. Paul says it. We'll go to it. But number 14, he had to wave the heave offering and present the blood to the Father at the mercy seat in heaven. The actual blood of Christ. This is what I believe. And, you know, because here's the thing. Why would God put all these things, all, this, all these symbols to put in, and all these things actually happen? You know, Jesus actually dies at even on the, um, the Passover. Then you have him rising the day after the Sabbath day, right, on Sunday. And then all of a sudden, he doesn't really have to put the blood on the mercy seat, though. Even though every single year, the high priest had to, you know, they had to do all these special things, and, and, and then he had to wipe the blood on his ear, his right thumb, his right toe, and he could only enter once a year, the high priest, right? And he had to, what, sprinkle the blood of that atonement on the mercy seat, which was in the veil, right? So here's the, here's the thing. The veil was rent in twain, and Jesus rose from the dead, so how's he going to go in there? That, that temple's no, not, not of any good use anymore, is it? So where, which, which mercy seat does he have to go to? Well, he has to go to the real one, doesn't he? So 
Now, I do want, I'm just going to skip through this. I know we're, I'm way over time here. But Jesus does, when he rises from the dead, who's the first person he meets? Mary Magdalene. And, you know, he says, touch me not, for I've not yet ascended to my father. Why does he say that to her? I'm, I'm just going to read it for you. In John 20, verse 17, it says, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So is he talking about the ascension 40 days later? Well, no, because in Matthew chapter 28, it says, And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hell, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. So why is he telling Mary, don't touch me? And then like these, this same group, So because Mar Mary is the first person he sees, he tells her to go tell the rest of them. And then, so in, the, in a parallel passage, they're touching his feet. Well, how do you explain that? Well, because Jesus doesn't have any limitations anymore. He can go as fast as he wants. He's going to go to heaven. Because look, if he doesn't take the blood to the mercy seat, he doesn't appear to God the Father as the first fruits on that day, then he's breaking scripture, isn't he? If he doesn't go on the day after the Sabbath as the first fruits, and then he has to, because he says, touch me not. Why would he say that? Well, because, I mean, just think about in the Old Testament. Could a woman that had seven devils cast out of her walk up and hug the high priest as he's walking up with the blood to put sprinkle onto the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement? Could he do that? No. What is Jesus now? Jesus is now the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I'm not saying that she would have made him sinful if she touched him or whatever, but he's still not going to let her touch him until he, he takes that blood up there. That's what I believe. And then eight days later, remember... Um, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus came in the midst of them, but eight days later, he says, touch me, handle me. So what changed? Well, he had to have already gone up and put that blood on the mercy seat, because otherwise, why would he say to her, don't touch me, but then other people just moment, you know, minutes later are grabbing around his feet. He's saying, go ahead, Thomas, put, put your you know, fingers in the holes of my, in my hands and in my, you know, put, put your hand into my side. So something changed. He ascended up, he put the blood on the mercy seat, and he came back down. So turn to 1 Corinthians 5.20. 1 Corinthians 5.20. I'm really almost done, really. I'm trying my, my hardest. So 1 Corinthians 5.20. It says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Paul's not just putting this here for no reason. He is the first fruits of them that slept, which is, ta is tying it back to Leviticus chapter 23, the feast of the Lord. Look at verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. We are waiting right now for Christ's coming, but in the meantime, we're get, trying to get as many people saved as we can. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. This is the last place I'll have you turn. I'll say a few things and we'll be done. All right? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. The Bible says, But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a great and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of, of goats and calves, but by, what does it say there? By his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. Did Jesus literally take his blood into the holy place? Which holy place? Not the one made with hands. Not the building made with hands, right? It says, having obtained eternal redemption for us. When does he do this? After he's already obtained it. But then, remember what I said, when, you know, if you pay a bill and you write the check and you just leave it sitting on the counter, when Jesus died as the Lamb of God and the blood, if the blood just trickled down onto the ground and it was just left there and it wasn't special, it didn't mean anything. 
then did the blood get to the place that it needed to go to? Because it needed to go to the mercy seat. Because uh, the mercy seat is what? Between the two cherubims and the earthly tabernacle by the pattern that was showed to Moses. And so God would come down in the, in the, in the uh, cloudy pillar and the, and the mercy seat was you know, behind the veil that nobody could go to, just the high priest, the, 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 things are, the staves are sticking out of it. And then the high priest would go in there and flick that, that blood there on the mercy seat where God would meet with them. So then nine, verse, chapter 9, verse 23, it says, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So did he appear in the presence of God for us? Yes, he did. When did he do that? Well, I, I believe that he did it the day that he arose from the dead after he said, Mary, don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to my father. He ascends to his father. He comes back down. And then he stays with them for 40 days. He's seen by people. And then he rises and then he goes back up into heaven. And he's waiting to come back, right? That, I mean, hopefully you guys all follow that. If you don't, just rewind it later on. So, so basically what I'm saying is the check had to go to the right place. He had to take the blood to the place where it goes. Where does the atoning blood have to go? Well, it had to go to the mercy seat. He had to appear before God because the propitiation, the appeasement of God had to be paid and it had to go to heaven. He had to appear into, he had to go into heaven itself and appear in the presence of God for us. Isn't that what it says? So, it says, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him Shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation? That's the day that we're all looking forward to. So just in closing, you know, the most important aspect of the gospel is that it is simple, childlike faith in the finished work. So all this stuff is just, you know, lots of detail. But the most important thing to get is that being saved is super easy. All you have to do is have a childlike faith to be saved. And you'll have to understand all those intricacies that I just mentioned, but you do have to understand that you can't do it by yourself. Jesus had to do it all for us, and he's, you know, you want to talk about Superman or all these heroes or whatever, these fake Marvel comics in D.C., that stuff's all make-believe, folks. It's not, it's not real. Jesus Christ is the actual real superhero. So, um, and I realize, again, that's a lot of doctrine, there's a lot of stuff to go through, but... And again, you might not agree with everything I preach, but I'll just say this. Search the scriptures, whether these things are so. You know, and if you're just, if you like had some trouble with some of the things I said, you know, and if you don't agree with me on some of the things I said, that's fine. But I would just say, just look at what the Bible says, because the Bible should be your final authority, not me or not some other man, but the Bible itself. So, and the gospel means glad tidings or good news. Christ came to take away our sins he paid a great price to do it, so let's appreciate him for his unspeakable gift. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this great church. I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to bless it for the next years to come, and Lord, that uh, this would always be a place for people to come and be able to hear the truth of your word, Lord. I pray that the gospel message would always be preached here. I pray that you would just bless all these people, uh, bless Pastor Taver and his family, uh, as they minister here and the people here that would be supportive of him. And Lord, that more laborers would come to the harvest and many people would be saved in the years to come here. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.